On the 29th of May 1985, English football champions Liverpool FC and the Italian champions Juventus met in the Belgian capital Brussels to play for the European Cup. This match, the European Cup final, is one of the big fixtures in the football calendar, but the tragic events that unfolded that afternoon before the game even began would cast a shadow over the world of football for years to come. The factors were all there. Fierce rivalry, hooliganism, inadequate policing and corruption. Add to this volatile mix lots of alcohol, overcrowded conditions and a completely unsuitable venue and the result was 39 people killed and over 600 wounded in what some have described as one of football's darkest days. This has been one of the more difficult stories I've covered in terms of getting to the knob of actually who was responsible. Some sources lay the blame squarely and solely on the Liverpool fans, saying that they were the only guilty party. Other sources take into account the behaviour of the Juventus fans, poor organisation by UEFA, the Belgian police, whose actions seem to me to veer between being completely inept and overtly violent. So, I'll try my best to present here the facts and the stories I see it, but with many conflicting eyewitness accounts, it's difficult to provide a definitive single version. So to set the scene, the period between the mid-1970s to the mid-1980s was one in which European football struggled to deal with the problems of pitch invasions, violence and hooliganism. Many football teams had hardcore groups of supporters within their fan base. Supporters who enjoyed a good old dust-up with rivals fans as much, if not more, than the game itself. They'd come fully prepared for mass brawls, armed with shivs, iron bars, Stanley knives, you know, you name it. These firms, as they were known, included some notorious names, like if you were growing up in Britain in the 80s like I did, you definitely didn't want to meet anybody from, for example, the Millwall Boschwackers, the Leeds United Service Crew, or West Ham's infamous intercity firm. The hooligan problem wasn't confined to just domestic games, it was well known that these firms or crews would happily travel abroad to cause trouble. This had happened many times prior to 1985, and England fans already had a bad reputation in Europe. So when planning for a big game like the European Cup final, crowd safety and crowd control should have been at the top of the list for the match organisers UEFA. But with hindsight, they seem to have made a very strange choice in selecting the venue for the 1985 Cup Final. Now, available at the time to host the game were Madrid's Santiago Bernabeu Stadium and Barcelona's Camp Nou. They're both big, recently renovated football grounds. However, it was Brussels' ageing and somewhat decrepit Heysel Stadium that was chosen. Built in the 1920s, Heysel Stadium was a lovely example of early Art Deco design, and over the years it had hosted all manner of track and field event, as well as cycling and boxing matches. It survived the Second World War intact, but by the late 70s and early 80s, it was a sad shadow of its former glory. Terraces were outdated with no seating, and the concrete safety barriers were cracked and decaying. Some parts of the terraces hadn't had any renovation work carried out on them since the day the stadium was built. It was old, it was tired, and it showed. Jerry Clarkson, the Deputy Chief of London Fire Brigade, later stated that the condition of Heysel Stadium was Beyond belief. Completely unfit. In the stanchions that supported the crowd control barriers, the reinforcing bars were already exposed. They could not have contained even moderate pressure. The piers on the wall which collapsed were built the wrong way round. Prior to the game, officials from both Liverpool and Juventus had urged UEFA officials to change the venue, warning of the danger posed by the outdated infrastructure. But UEFA refused to change the venue. They'd given it a quick 30-minute inspection and apparently that was enough to get the go-ahead. Now, one comment I read suggested that, in fact, the decision to stick with Heysel was actually a parting gift to a high-up Belgian UEFA official who was retiring, but I haven't been able to confirm that during my research. The next step on the road to disaster came from the arrangement of the fans inside the stadium. Attendance was expected to be around 55 to 60,000 spectators, which were mainly Liverpool and Juventus fans. 
The Liverpool fans, the Reds, would have one end of the stadium and the Juventus fans would be kept at the opposite end and between them there'd be neutral ground. However, with the match being played in Belgium, there was a ticket allowance made for neutral fans. And these tickets, they were only available to buy in Belgium, were intended for corporate use or for any Belgian football fans who wanted to show up to the game. Somehow, these tickets found their way into the hands of unscrupulous ticket agents who sold them on the black market, and they almost all got sold to Juventus. Now, for some reason, the so-called neutral zone had been allocated Stand Z, which was up in the Liverpool end. So, as the supposedly neutral block began to fill up with Juventus fans, they were only separated from the tightly packed Liverpool fans by a thin, flimsy chicken wire fence and eight Belgian police officers. Entry into the stadium by all accounts had been chaotic. Belgian police, who were fed up with the unruly and drunken fans causing trouble in the city centre and outside the stadium, were more than happy to get as many of them as possible packed into the stadium as early as possible. Fans spoke of getting in without even having their tickets checked, which resulted in unchecked tickets being passed back to allow extra fans without tickets to get in. Eyewitnesses told of rowdy groups that were just kicking big holes through the crumbling cinder block walls and then just scrambling through the big hole and getting inside without paying. The upshot of all this was that well over an hour before kickoff, the Liverpool and Juventus ends were already packed. It was hot, sweaty, and many people had had far too much to drink. There was no love lost between these two clubs, and taunts, chants and gestures soon turned to missiles being lobbed. Fans found that the crumbling stands provided a nice supply of rocks to chuck as they kicked the old terraces into pieces. Down at the Juventus end, the Ultras, the hardcore Juventus crew, had already broken down barriers and were facing off against the Belgian police on the edge of the pitch. The mood of the afternoon was turning sour, tempers were fraying and drunk fans were getting restless waiting for the game to start. And then something happened and the mood got very ugly very quickly. Some accounts say that word got around that a young Liverpool fan had been beaten up by Juventus. Another eyewitness account described fireworks being let off by the ultras that were fired into the crowd at the Liverpool end. Whatever the actual reason, there was a sudden eruption of anger and the result was tragic. In the zone behind the goal, there was a surge from the Liverpool fans, charging down the thin wire fence and overrunning the weak police presence. As the Liverpool fans tore into Z block, the Belgian police seemed powerless to stop them, and the panicked Juventus fans, seeing the horde of yelling yobs charging down on them, stampeded to the far side of Z block, only to find their way barred by the concrete wall at the end and the crowd control barriers to the front. As the frantic crowd pushed from behind, those pressed up against the wall just had nowhere to go. The pressure of the crush became unbearable, and within a few moments, the old concrete block wall gave way, then a mass of struggling, crushed people went over within. Juventus fan and grandfather Otto Laurentini had bought tickets for his son Roberto and the two nephews, Andrea and Gianni. He was in Z-Block and he remembered vividly the moment that it all went horribly wrong. They charged. We retreated. There were women and children with us. I saw the wall getting closer. I escaped through a gap at the top of the terrace. Then I found myself on the pitch. I shouted Roberto's name. I saw my nephew Andrea with his head in his hands. Roberto was lying on the terrace. I put my ear to his chest and listened. I thought I could hear a pulse but I realised it was my own heart thumping. He was dead. A television crew was filming me. Later, I saw footage of myself finding my dead son. It was a catastrophe. In the chaos and panic, people were being trampled underfoot and crushed to death by the pressure of the crowd surging from behind. Riot police waded into the melee, batons swinging, lashing out at anyone in striking distance, compounding the confusion. At first, nobody seemed to realise just how bad things were. Singing, chanting and rioting continued as bodies were being pulled out from the tangle of humanity next to the collapsed wall and hauled away on makeshift stretchers. TV cameras filmed the disaster live as it unfolded, 
incredulous commentators struggling to find words to describe the terrible scene that was being played out in front of them. Captains from both teams appealed for calm over the stadium loudspeakers, but it was already too late. As the minutes passed by and order began to be restored, the area was cleared and the horrible truth laid bare. 39 people were dead, the youngest of them just 11 years old. Over 600 spectators had been injured. Block Z looked like the aftermath of a bomb blast, with debris and bodies littering the stand. Shocked and dazed fans and police stood around seemingly dumbfounded at what had just happened. People couldn't seem to take in what they were seeing. It was just too awful. Then, to the surprise of almost everyone, including most of the players, officials decided to carry on with the game. The match kicked off even as a temporary mortuary was being set up in the car park and the hundreds of injured were being treated or rushed to hospital. Images of the jubilant Juventus star Michel Platini, bare-chested and grinning as he held up the winner's cup and ran a lap of glory around the pitch, seemed completely irreconcilable with the images of horror which were witnessed just hours earlier. To many, playing the game under such terrible circumstances seemed to be in very poor judgement indeed. Officials defended this decision, saying that they feared more violence if the game wasn't played, but many today look back upon the decision to play as a big mistake. Mark Lawrenson, one of the Liverpool players, remembered the Belgian Chief of Police ordering the players to carry on with the game. The Chief of Police for the game then came into our dressing room and said that the game was going ahead and we all said, we're not playing when people were dying. We asked what the Juventus players had said and he told us that they too had said they weren't playing the game. He said that he couldn't be held responsible for what happened if the game didn't kick off. Whatever we said to him, it didn't make any difference. The inquiry into the Heysel disaster seems to have been ad hoc at best. There was a notable lack of coordinated effort to get to the root causes of the tragedy. A Belgian judge, Marina Kopieters, released a report 18 months later in which the blame was laid directly and solely on the Liverpool fans. This suited the UA for officials as it deflected attention from any poor planning on their part. Only the English fans were responsible. Of that, there is no doubt. Reports detailing the appalling condition of the stadium, the black market selling of tickets, the poor policing and seemingly haphazard seating arrangements were either discounted or not given as evidence. Four years later, in 1989, criminal proceedings began. 29 people stood trial for their roles in the tragedy, 26 Liverpool fans and three Belgian officials. 14 fans were found guilty of manslaughter and sentenced to three years in prison. Albert Rusens, the head of the Belgian Football Association, was given a six-month suspended sentence for criminal negligence. And Johan Mahayu, the police officer in charge of Z-Block, was given a nine-month sentence. The rest of the defendants were acquitted. A civil trial, brought by bereaved relatives against UEFA officials, resulted in no convictions. But despite UEFA coming out of the whole affair unblemished, the president at the time, Jacques Georges, wrote shortly before his death in 2004, Do you think that I'm not revisited by visions of the blood running down Terrace Z and the piles of mutilated bodies? It is a burden I will carry to my deathbed, but I am not ever going to discuss this in public. Although the wounds from Heysel remained open and raw for years afterwards, it seemed that neither Liverpool or Juventus had any real desire to mark or remember the occasion. Indeed, if anything, it seems like all involved wished to forget the tragedy as soon as possible. Michel Platini, the goal scorer that night, rarely talks publicly about it, and the event is not spoken of at Liverpool club reunions. Mark Lawrenson says it's the elephant in the room. It was just never mentioned. No one talked about it. For years, the Heysel disaster didn't even warrant a mention on the Juventus club official website. The Heysel disaster seems to hold a special place of ignominy in football's history, a dark stain which brings back unpleasant memories of yobbish behaviour and crass and insensitive decision-making. The two teams eventually met again in 2005. Fans at the Liverpool end held up a huge sign, Amikizia, 
friendship, but witnesses report that many Juventus fans turn their backs to this display. It seems that in the world of football rivalry, it might be easier to forget than it is to forgive. <laughs>